This morning, um, I would like to just leave a short devotion with you. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5 from verse 23. Mark chapter 5 from verse 23. And then one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, saw him and fell at his feet. And he besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years, and she had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in and pressed behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. This morning I entitled this sermon, Between Brackets. Between Brackets. Now if you look at the first four books of the New Testament, known as the Gospels, um, you know I had art as a subject in high school. I wasn't actually good at it, but it was something that uh, my brother enjoyed and I wanted to compete with him and say I can also uh, do a portrait like you. He still does it today. Um, I went no further than drawing smiley faces, emoticons that you have on your phones today. And uh, what we call in Afrikaans, stop money, stick men, right? Now when you draw, when you sketch, when you paint, those are portraits. And this is a portrait that Mark gives us of Jesus in his version. Or if you like taking photographs, like my mother, who when she started, we used to smile as best as we could. But when the photos came, there were no heads. If you like taking photos, you are a photographer. And this is a photo of Jesus that Mark gives us this morning. We, of course, know that the author of this book is Mark. And it is the shortest book of the four Gospels. And I trust, I pray, that if I ask who has read Mark chapter 17, no one will lift up your hands. Mind you, I asked that one Sabbath and someone raised his hand. Mark only has 16 chapters. And so it is called the book of action. Because everything in here has to do with more what Jesus did than what he said. So Mark's portrait, his photo of Jesus, is a man of action. Now the story of this woman seems as if it was not meant to be included when you look at the beginning of this chapter. Because it is so to say in brackets. Now brackets, all our Literature experts or those who have done English know that brackets are defined as a pair of marks used to enclose words or figures so as to separate them from the context. So the context of this chapter is Jairus and his daughter. But in brackets we have the woman with the issue of blood. We read in verse 21 that Jairus was an important leader. He was very rich, he was affluent, he was an important man in the church of his time. Verse 21 says that he was a ruler of the synagogue. And today we would see him as an elder or maybe even a pastor. But with, even of, with all the authority that this man had, he could not heal his daughter's illness. And thus he ran to Jesus and asked him to heal his daughter. And Jesus says, yes, Jesus walks and he is focused on Jairus' daughter. But suddenly, in brackets, comes a woman. No name, no power, no status, only a woman. And a woman had no rights. She was ill for 12 years with an abnormal condition called blood flowing. Her blood flow would not stop, and her persistent bleeding certainly caused her to be very weak, very tired, and drained of energy. Now it's one thing to experience a bad day, or a bad week, even a month or a year. But this woman had a bad 12 years. 
And given that the life expectancy of women in those days was 40 years, close to half of her life was spent in agony. And under the Jewish law in Leviticus chapter 12 and Leviticus 19 verse 19 to 30, she was an untouchable. Nobody could touch her. She was cut off from the rest of society. She was an outcast. She could not marry, or if she was married, her blood flow was a condition for divorce. No husband, no children, no family, no friends, nobody. She could not even go to the temple, to the church to worship. She could not visit. She was an outcast. And according to Leviticus, anything or anyone she touched would be regarded as unclean. If she touched someone, that person had to wash their clothes, take a bath, and be considered unclean until the evening. She infected everything that she touched, a walking virus. For 12 years, she lived in isolation. For all our mathematicians out here, anyone good at math? Okay, everyone is being honest. I don't know why I raised my hand as well. <laughs> now let's do some math. Now I went to an Orthodox Jew and I asked him to explain this to me um, regarding the, the amount, the period of time that this woman would have been unclean since the start till the end would she would be clean again. And he told me this and I made the sum. So when you started with your blood flow, you would be unclean for seven days. Seven days. So for every extra day of blood flow, she would be unclean for seven more days. And nobody could touch you or you could not touch anything. So let's do it with our calendar and not the Hebrew calendar. Twelve years, 365 days. You've got three years with 366 days. Okay, So 365 times nine, nine years, is 3,285 days. Then you have three leap years, 3 times 366, 1,098. Wait, that sounded a little bit like Jacob Zuma. 1,098. <laughs> so 1,098 plus 3,285 equals 4,383 days. Now we multiply that with 7 because she would be unclean for 7 days. So 4,383 times 7 is 30,000 681. That was the days that she was unclean. Now we divide that by 365 in a year, it equals 84. And 84 years she would be unclean. For 84 years, that is equal to a life without hope. This lady had physical problems because she was weak and she was sick. She had financial problems because it says in verse 26 that she spent all of her money on doctors. She had social problems because no one could come to her. Everyone had to avoid her because she was unclean. And then lastly, she had spiritual problems because she could not go to the temple or church. And remember in those days, if you could not go to the temple, it was believed that God did not know you. Have you ever heard someone say, you can own all the money in the world, but if you do not have your health, it does not matter at all. This woman, this anonymous woman, was poor and very sick. She had no health and no wealth. In hospital today, the doctors would tell her that there's no hope for you. Your money is finished. Medical aid is finished nothing worked she tried everything now in the talmud which is a commentary about the books of moses there were 11 different cures for this woman's condition so you have the torah which is the five books of moses then you have the mishnah which is the unwritten laws given to moses that the jews believed the mishnah is the commentary about the torah the five books then you have the Talmud, which is the commentary about the Mishnah, which is the commentary about the Torah. And this is why the Pharisees had such a big problem when they stared in the mirror each day to see where did I fall and where did I succeed. 
Now, according to the Talmud, there were 11 different cures. Now, listen very carefully to this. It might sound like an episode of fear factor. A remedy for the person with blood flow was to carry the ashes of an ostrich egg in a linen bag in summer and then in a cotton bag in winter. Anyone tired to snatch an ostrich egg from an ostrich? Another remedy was to carry a piece of corn that you found in the droppings of a white female donkey. So now you have to look for a donkey. You have to look for a female donkey. You have to look for a white female donkey. And you have to wait for that white female donkey to do its business. And then go and look for a piece of corn in fresh droppings and carry it with you. Fear factor indeed. Third, you could eat grasshopper eggs. That's not so bad. The fourth one, you had to keep the tooth of a fox with you. Anyone try to catch a fox? To get that tooth out? The fourth one was to carry the fingernail of a person who died via hanging. Imagine the problems from the family you'd get trying to do that. And then sixth, the person could also cut and burn the infected area. These were all the options that the woman had. Imagine trying to look for that corn kernel or trying to catch a fox. And she most probably tried all these methods because the Bible says she spent all of her means looking for a cure with no success. But it doesn't stop there because chapter 5, verse 20 and 27 and 28 says, She heard of Jesus. Where did she hear about Jesus? Well, others came to Jesus and were healed. She heard and believed that Jesus could heal her. And she said, if only I could touch him. She had heard about Jesus. She was desperate and had no hope. Her symptoms began years before Jesus' ministry on earth. And when she heard about Jesus, she had suffered for 12 years. And I imagine she immediately walked to Jesus as soon as she heard. She left everything behind her, all the pain, all the tears, the humiliation of her own people. She left everything behind her and continued. She did not stop walking and she walked for nearly 45 kilometers. And all that went through her mind, through the pain, through the weakness, was now there is hope. My last hope. Touch him. I just need to touch him. And it was not an easy thing for her to do. It was a dangerous thing for her to do. Because according to the law of her own people, if you are unclean, you're not supposed to touch anyone. It would pollute them and make them unclean. And there was a great crowd that day when she eventually reached Jesus. The Bible says they thronged about him in Mark 5 verse 24. And even by touching the clothes of Jesus, she would infect him and make him unclean. But she had heard how the lepers touched Jesus and healed him. She had heard of the blind receiving their sight. She had heard of the deaf being able to hear. She had heard of the lame and the crippled being able to walk again. Yes, she had heard of Jesus. If only I touch his clothes, I can get well. Verse 28 of Mark chapter 5 says that as she came, she fell among the crowd. She was a nobody. She was nothing. Unlike Jairus, who boldly came to Jesus in front of everyone, she had to hide because she was not supposed to be there. She thought she could not approach Jesus. For who am I? But with Jesus, it's not who you are, but who he is. She sees the crowd around Jesus. Everyone, even Jesus, walks to Jairus' house, focused on him while she is living in brackets. She is following him keeping a low profile, following impressed by the crowd. She tries to keep up with him. She is weak 
but she puts everything on the line with the last inch of strength. Lunging forward and stretching her fingertips, she falls down on her hands and knees. Finally, I touched the hem of his garment. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says that this woman found relief when she fell down at the feet of Jesus, reaching out and touching him. Verse 29, immediately, now usually someone was healed when Jesus touched or spoke to them, but here someone is healed when they touch Jesus, and not just Jesus, but his clothes. After 12 years of torture and suffering, immediately she got well, and immediately she knew it. And that word in the Greek, we must understand that the word immediately comes from the word euthios, which means an explosion. There was an explosion in her bones when she touched Jesus. For those avid fans in our childhood days watching Dragon Ball Z, you see the days when Goku powers up like that. Can you feel that explosion going through her body when she touches the hem of Jesus' garment? Jesus felt this. Jesus felt and he asked, who touched my clothes? Do you think Jesus really doesn't know who or what touched him? But when Jesus asks such a question, it is not for his benefit. It is for the benefit of the people around him and us today. For some of us today think and feel that Jesus is too far away, that he can't see me and my cross and my burdens. Yet he is close enough to reach out to when we close our eyes and pray. Jesus was so full of power that he transmitted to the edge of the hem of his garment and faith caused healing power to flow onto this woman. When Jesus asked who touched him, the disciples asked, but now how can you ask such a thing when you see all these hundreds of people around you? But Jesus knew Something important happened that day. It was just not an ordinary touch. It was a touch of faith. He now focuses on the faith of this nobody with no status, no power, no rights, unclean. She did not even want to look at him when she asked because she was not supposed to be there. She was not supposed to be there. She knew that people would certainly acknowledge and see that this is the woman who was not supposed to be here. They might even go so far as to kill her because she touched them as well and they would be unclean until the evening. She perhaps thought that Jesus asked this question so that he could shame her in front of everyone because she made him unclean when she touched him. That perhaps he would say to her, why did you try and steal healing from me today? Much like those of us today who not, do not want some dust on our suits or our cars. I remember having a friend who he made sure that his car was washed every, every day. And uh, as he was speaking the one day, I just leaned on the car as we were speaking. And when I moved up out of the way, he came with a cloth and he tried to dusted off there it must be clean when Jesus asked the question this woman decided that she had no way out and she then told Jesus what she had done she told him her life story she told him how she was shaken how she was forsaken she told him everything that had happened to her probably with tears in her eyes but with a smile, Jesus said to her, Mark 5, 34, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be healed of your sickness. And the word that is used there for healing is sozo, which means you have been saved. You have been delivered. You are protected. You are preserved. You have been made whole. Now when Jairus, whose daughter had died, when he saw this, his faith was strengthened. 
And it's no coincidence that his daughter died at the age of 12 and this woman had been bleeding for 12 years. This woman had suffered from excessive blood flow for 12 years and those words of Jesus come to us today. It is not who we are and what we've done. It's about who Jesus is and what He has done. She had to fall when she could touch and cure Jesus' clothes on her hands and knees. And after 12 years, she did not fear, even though the people scorned her, even though she was living in brackets because of a diseased life, when nobody would acknowledge her existence, she just believed in Jesus and she was healed. And I'm glad today that this woman has no name because all of us can identify with her and put our names in that chapter. We are all like this woman. We are sick with sin. We are sick with physical problems. We are sick with financial problems, with social problems, with spiritual problems. We have problems. But today we are here because we have heard of Jesus. Can you imagine being sick and knowing that there was someone who could heal you? Can you imagine that someone could heal you of your ailment? Cancer, TB, diabetes, doesn't matter what you have, you know someone can heal you. Imagine going to Jesus with no arm and walking away with two. Imagine going with no legs and coming and running and jumping because you got two legs. Imagine not being able to hear and singing the sweetest melodies afterwards. Imagine not being able to see and leaving Jesus adorning His creation. Someone who could heal you and heal you free of charge. All you had to do was get to that person. All of us today might have traveled life's difficult circumstances, starved, struggling, afflicted, but we have heard of Jesus. All manner of illness, all manner of disease, all manner of sickness with a word, a touch, immediately, totally, wholly healed because of Jesus. He healed the demon-possessed. He healed the paralytic. He healed the lame. He healed the dumb. He healed the deaf. He healed the deranged. He healed them all. With this Jesus, I have driven a car with a dead battery. I remember a lady phoning me. Her son had just died. He was murdered. And that month was a difficult month for us. But I prayed and I asked Jesus, please help me. I need to get to this family because they are in need. I knew that the battery had problems. But I went little food in the cupboard but I went because that is what ministry is about I got there and it was a blessing I left and before I could pull off the family said to me pastor open your boot and as I opened my boot by the time they had finished packing stuff in there you could see as the car drove that it was unbalanced. When I got to the car dealership the next day, the salesman came to me, the repairs guy, and he says to me, listen, tell me, how were you able to drive with a dead battery? And I said, this is the Jesus that I serve. This is the Jesus that we serve. The Jesus whose office is manifold, whose promises are sure, whose light is matchless, whose goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting and His love does not change. His word is enough and His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous, His yoke is easy and His burden is light. He is uncomprehensible, He's invincible, He's irresistible. The heavens cannot contain Him, let alone a sinful man like me explain Him to you. You can't get Him out of your mind, you can't get Him off your hands, you can't outlive Him and you cannot live without Him. 
The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found that they could not stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him, and the witness had to lie to get him behind bars. Herod couldn't kill him, death couldn't handle him, and the grave could not hold him. That is the Jesus that we serve. He was, he is, and he will always be. He had no predecessor, and he'll have no successor. There was nobody before him, and there'll be nobody after him. You cannot impeach him, and he's not going to resign. That is the Jesus that we have heard of. Brothers and sisters, you have been shaken, but you are not forsaken. As I end, I'd like to tell you about my own testimony. You know, growing up, I had a great-grandfather and a grandfather who served in the Navy. And uh, every time they lived in Mossel Bay and we were in Cape Town, every time we went to go visit, my grandmother had their medals on the walls in the, the passage. And as a small boy walking through that passage, you see the photo and you see those medals shining. And you hear the stories of their bravery. And I decided from a young age that I was going to join the Navy. I practiced hard. I, I studied hard. I did the best that I could in all spheres of my being. It was so much so that every day I used to swim 100 laps just to be fit enough. Run 2Ks every day. Make sure that my grades are good because I'm going to the Navy. I'm going to be made. I'm going to be proud of my family. They're going to be proud of me. When I was in grade 11, that's standard 9, I didn't feel well at school. We at Helderberg High School at the time. And I told Mr. Van Hursten, who is still a teacher there today, so I'm not feeling well. I, I need to go home because I just can't concentrate. And a week before this, uh, two weeks before this, I used to sleep with a five-liter bottle of water, drink it throughout the night, wake up and still be thirsty and hungry, and I was frail. I went from 75 kilograms to 50 kilograms in three months. Didn't know what was going on. My mother took me to the doctor and said she must, they must test me for drugs. That day at school, I, I, I left school and I went home. And if you know Helderberg, you know everything is uphill. So as I walked uphill past the soccer field, I just blacked out. And when I woke up, I was in hospital. And the doctor said, son, do you know that you could have died? Because when we tested your sugar, it was 34.5. Normal levels are between 4 and 7.5. I was a vegan. I did everything right. I couldn't understand because now I could not join the Navy. There goes my life's plans. What do I do now? I sat in that hospital. And mind you, they started to feed me with the IV drip. The vest that I had on, after two days, burst at the sides. Because my body was being fed now. As I sat there, my mother sat with me every day. And she said... Don't worry, things will still be okay. The doctor said, you've got type 1 diabetes, it will never be cured for the rest of your life. And I asked God, why did this happen to me? It feels as though I have been forsaken. Everything, all my plans flushed down the drain. I did not do anything to deserve this. Yet I have to struggle with this. And as I was watching TV in the hospital, there came, there was a channel on, and there was this, this man preaching. And the words that he preached were from Corinthians, where Paul says, three times I prayed to God to remove this thorn from my flesh. And I believe that when you have a thorn in your flesh, you don't pray three times, you pray much more. And God answers him, not directly, but he just says to him, Paul, it doesn't matter what you're going through. My grace is sufficient for thee. Now the word for thorn that Paul uses has got two meanings. It's something that's so small like a splinter that you cannot get out. It irritates you. And the second meaning, it's something so big that it impales you that you cannot move. And that is how I felt at that moment. But God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. 
For no matter what you are going through, what, what you are, have been through, and what you will still go through, my grace will be the same and it is sufficient for you. Today I still suffer from this disease. I try and live as healthily as possible. I have been shaken to my core, but I am not forsaken. For God's grace has been sufficient for me. God's grace was sufficient for this woman who was nobody, had nothing, and he turned her life around. Today we serve the God who can still heal us immediately, right this moment, who can deliver us from our situations because he is able. We serve a God who might say, I want you to learn something from this lesson. I want you to get some patience. I want you to understand the pain of others maybe. And He heals you later. He delivers you later in this life. We serve a God who sometimes decides not to deliver us. But continually reminds us that His grace is sufficient. So no matter how bad you've been shaken... No matter what you're going through, remember that you are not forsaken.